Welcome to Shattering Us, a program which is devoted to the fastest growing segment of the world society. To those of you who know that political, religious, military, economic institutions, as well as academic and media companies are corrupt, that they are counterproductive, they can't be fixed. Our mission, therefore, is to discover to expose who is working against our interests, to understand how and why they're doing so. Because exposing and condemning such schemes isn't hateful, even when they're religious and patriotic. It's the most compassionate thing we can do. In our concluding hour, we're going to continue to evaluate the evidence against Paul to demonstrate that he was not inspired by God. Our phone number, if you'd like to participate in this discussion any time over the next three hours, we welcome your call and uh, comments, 877-300-7645. We even expect that our lines will work today. Yesterday there was a, uh, a glitch that um, uh, has been resolved. Maybe that was actually two days ago because we did have a number of conversations with listeners yesterday. I want to continue the story that we were discussing, speaking of yesterday, about the Boko Haram. Boko Haram, by the way, has released a new videotape. Um, it shows the, their symbol, which is AK-47s uh, superimposing a Quran. They quote from the Quran. They reveal that everything they do is consistent with Muhammad's example and Allah's uh, orders. They're correct. Uh, they're not taking the worst of what Muhammad did and said or what Allah allegedly revealed out of context to um, corrupt their religion. The fact of the matter is that the vast preponderance of what Muhammad did, what he said, and the overwhelming preponderance of what Allah encouraged is consistent with what Boko Haram is doing. Now, I do want to uh, speak briefly to this before we return to our <laughs> story, the uh, story that I was covering yesterday. And that is that um, many of you know that I wrote what is one of, if not the most comprehensive, chronological, and contextual presentations ever compiled of Islam's five oldest and most credible sources. The book was called Prophet of Doom. I reveal it in past tense, uh, not only because I wrote this book uh, a decade ago, but because after paying to make that book available to anyone who would want to read it or listen to it in MP3, HTML, and PDF files, and it's entirely, entirely free for that decade, the, uh, the site has been so savagely hacked by Muslims who can't deal with the truth, that it has been down now for about a month. I would expect that it would, it's going to remain down for maybe two months. It, Muslims uh, have launched denial of service attacks against it. It's the same thing that hackers do, and that was the story in the early part of the news. It's the same thing that hackers uh, do to, um, uh, to elicit uh, bribes um, from gambling sites. For example, if you have an offshore gambling uh, internet site, hackers will try to bring it down with denial of service attacks and then say, we'll stop those, uh, those attacks if you pay us X number of millions of dollars. In the case of uh, Prophet of Doom, Muslims were unable to refute anything in the book because it's based entirely on the five most credible Islamic sources. And so they've simply uh, done what Muslims do, silenced the, uh, the book by hacking it, hacking the site. Rackspace, which was the, one of the largest servers, um, is uh, uninterested in uh, having, bearing any pain 
uh, or any cost for letting the truth be known. And the Prophet Doom site is an extremely important site. Muslims uh, around the world uh, read it and listened to it. In fact, uh, the highest per capita listenership for the MP3 files of the entire book, Prophet of Doom, was in Iran. Throughout the Middle East, a higher percentage of the population of Islamic countries visited the site and learned from it than do Americans or British or even Australians and, and uh, New Zealanders, even though it is written in English. And so it is a great loss for the world, particularly for Muslims. Muslims who, who know there's something desperately wrong with their religion because of the way the religious leaders treat them, because of the savage conditions they live in, because of the fear of the truth being proclaimed in any Islamic country. And as a result, they know there's something wrong, and they, in great numbers, turn to Prophet of Doom to learn the truth. But that site is no longer up. Rackspace uh, says, you know, the denial of service attacks cost us money, and uh, and we won't tolerate it. They brought down every one of uh, of our websites. Uh, the forum for yada yada, the yada yada site, introduction to uh, to God. Uh, even questioning Paul. We have subsequently retooled questioning Paul. The site is uh, back up and is running flawlessly. My good friend uh, I, and really extraordinary web designer in his free time, uh, which he has very little of, uh, has donated his time to reconstructing that site, and he is in the midst of reconstructing the Yada Yada Forum, the Yada Yada website, with, uh, which is up currently, and you can read the PDFs. You can access the PDFs, although the scribed pages don't work. Uh, and uh, also the introduction to God. He hopes to have all of them running, as is questioning Paul, within a matter of weeks. It may be a matter of months before we're back up with Prophet of Doom. And we really don't know what the solution is going to be. The kind of software that will thwart denial of service attack is very expensive. At the very least, it would cost me in the range of four to five thousand dollars a year. I make nothing from the site, uh, and for me to spend that kind of money um, is uh, I have a very low appetite for that recognizing that that may just be the tip of the iceberg in terms of the cost of keeping the site up. So that is an update as to where the websites are. We uh, expect to have, excuse me, uh, questioning poll, uh, continuing to work, and we expect to have yadayah.com, entertogod.org, uh, up running similar to it in the near future, and then one day we may resolve profit of dough. That said, the story I was reading to you yesterday and commenting on is not from an obscure source. It's not from an American media source. The story was not picked up by the American media, even though it may be the most important story of, uh, of our day. It's far more important than what is happening in Ukraine. It's far more important than what's happening in Thailand. It's far more important than the, uh, the, the debate over what language Yahshua spoke between Netanyahu and um, Pope um, Francis. It is a bigger story than any debate occurring in the United States. And that is the story of Boko Haram and what they are doing in Nigeria. And yet there isn't a single U.S. media outlet to pick up on the story of an insider telling us precisely what has happened to those girls, what Boko Haram does, how they act. There's an insider. The, the uh, Daily Mail uh, found this individual and interviewed him, and yet no one else picked up on the story. For those that don't know, the Daily Mail is one of the, uh, the more credible, the largest, uh, among the largest uh, 
newspapers in the United Kingdom. Of course, the biggest news outlet in the United Kingdom is the BBC. But the Daily Mail is, uh, is a very credible, very large news gathering agency. And yet uh, they picked up on the story, and yet they appear to be alone. And as I share this story with you, it's, uh, it is gruesome. It's horrific. The language isn't, but the vision of what occurred is. The story is important because the world doesn't want to deal with the fact that every Islamic terrorist organization, like Boko Haram, has one thing in common, Islam. The Islamic State in, uh, in Iraq and Syria that is so brutal is an Islamic organization. The Nusra Front, which is the largest of the fundamentalist Islamic terrorist organizations in Syria, is a fundamentalist Islamic organization. Their principal rival, uh, which would be Hezbollah, is a fundamentalist Islamic organization. The PLO and Fatah in the West Bank and in Gaza, along with Hamas, are fundamentalist Islamic organizations, as was the Muslim Brotherhood, as is the Muslim Brotherhood. Al-Qaeda. During its heyday, fundamentalist Islamic organization as is the Taliban. They only have one common denominator, and that is Islam. And their interpretation of Islam happens to be identical to what the words in the Quran and Hadith reveal. Sunni Muslims follow the Sunnah, or example of Muhammad. The example of Muhammad is presented in one place, in one place alone, in the Hadith, which are the oral reports from Muhammad and his companions. Those Hadith collections are compiled in but four sources, at least four that were compiled within 250 years of Muhammad's death. They are Ibn Ishaq's Sirah, which is the biography of Muhammad, which is a chronological presentation of uh, what can be known about Muhammad. It was written about 125 years after Muhammad's death. The Tariq was uh, compiled by Tabati. He was the world's foremost Quran scholar. Uh, he wrote about 200 years after Muhammad's death, but he actually didn't write the Tariq, which is the history of Islam's formation. No, simply... All he did was compile hadiths, all reports from Muhammad and his companions. And then there were two topical collections of hadith that were written within 200 years of Muhammad's death. They are one by Muslim, the other by Bukhari. They, along with the Quran, present 100% of what can be known about the common denominator. <laughs> I have provided a little background before we read this uh, story again. Is I want you to know with absolute certainty that Muhammad uh, kidnapped many uh, women. And many of the women that Muhammad personally played a role in kidnapping, he personally raped. In three of Muhammad's terrorist raids that he led himself, the oldest, most credible Islamic sources are all consistent, and they all have hadith, multiple hadith, that show that Muhammad participated in rape. That not only did his uh, initial Muslims, the jihadists that, that perpetrated these terrorist attacks on, on uh, unarmed communities, engage in kidnap and rape, that Muhammad himself um, ordained the practice that he prescribed the practice, that he himself participated, setting the sunnah or example that Muhammad, that Muslims follow today. There are three very vivid presentations 
of Muhammad raping the victims of his terrorist attacks. There are scores of accounts of Muhammad kidnapping individuals and holding them for ransom. There are countless examples in the Hadith, confirmed also in the Quran, of Muhammad enslaving women and children. Muhammad led 75 terrorist raids, led or inspired 75 terrorist raids in the first 10 years of the Islamic era, the moment he left Mecca in shame following the satanic verses. 75 in 10 years. It is about the only thing that the Quran and the Hadith discuss during the formation of the Islamic era. They are so prevalent. It is the sum total of the presentation. And so it would be accurate to say that if you are not engaged in kidnap, if you're not engaged in enslaving others, if you're not engaged and terrorist raids, if you're not engaged in rape, then if Muhammad is the example which the Quran says that good Muslims should follow, then you are not a good Muslim. According to the Quran and according to the Hadith, the only way to follow Muhammad's example and therefore to be a good Muslim would be to act like Boko Haram, to be rapists, to be kidnappers, to engage in the slave trade to be murderous terrorists. Now, it's not making any of this up. The proof is ubiquitous. It's undeniable. This is who Muhammad was. Muhammad is the sum total of Islam. This is affirmed in the Quran, and it is the bulk of the presentation in the Hadith. Now, with that background... Let's reveal the consequence of the world tolerating Islam, of the consequence of the President of the United States telling Muslims that they have a great religion and that this is their day. This is their opportunity. They should seize their opportunity. Let's look at the consequence of the United States providing weapons to Qatar that Qatar distributed in great quantity in Libya that are now being disseminated around the Muslims in Africa and are the very weapons being deployed by Boko Haram. This story, reported by the Daily Mail, reads as follows. Their faces scratched and bleeding. The pitiful remains of their once smart school uniforms ripped off of them and filthy. The two teenage girls were tethered to trees. Their wrists were bound with rope. And they were left in a clearing in the Nigerian bush to die by Islamist terrorist group Boko Haram. Despite having been raped and dragged through the thorn bushes, they were still alive. But just barely in the sweltering tropical heat and humidity. But that horrid depiction of Islam in our minds, we will pause here for the commercial interruption and take up the scene and our journey through the hell that Islam has unleashed after the commercial break. Stay with us. was discovered by a 15-year-old boy, Baba Goni. We're going to learn more about him in a moment. He said they were seated on the ground at the base of the trees. These are two of the nearly 300 girls that were kidnapped. They were seated on the ground at the base of the trees. Their legs were stretched out in front of them. They were hardly conscious. This young boy, 15-year-old, has seen more than 
you and I can't even imagine. And he was acting for as a guide for one of the many vigilante groups. They're called anti-machete, searching for uh, Nigerian school girls. You see, the government is uh, is inept. Good luck's government, completely and utterly inept. We had yesterday and the day before a general from the military of Nigeria saying, oh, yeah, we know where they are, but we're not going to tell you, and we're not going to do anything. You know, if you knew where they were, why would you go after them and rescue them? If you knew where they are, why would you announce that you knew where they are? If you don't know why they are, where they are, why are you lying about it? Now, the fact is that they weren't hard to find. They were an hour's drive north of the school that they kidnapped and burned down. And they were an hour's drive north for three days. They weren't hard to find. It's as if no one wants to find them. It's as if the media in the West don't want you to know this story. No, you know, the, the Muslim guy will get uh, the opportunity to speak at Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Berkeley and the University of Michigan. And he will get the opportunity to lie on behalf of Islam and to deceive so that young people, in particular, come to the errant conclusion that Boko Haram is corrupting Islam, that they haven't read their Quran, that they are being un-Islamic. So they'll have the Muslim guy on. They'll let him lie. But will they allow the voice of one, this Baba Goni, who was kidnapped by Boko Haram, who found these two young girls after they had been raped and tethered to a tree, left to die. Will they have him on? Will they consider his voice? Will they promote his story? No. Will they even go searching for these girls? No. It's the same reason that the Obama administration had no interest in capturing Osama bin Laden. They wanted him dead. It's the same reason that the Obama administration won't hold trials for any of those that they, they kill with their drones. Dead men tell no tales. They don't want the world to know what these girls have endured. They don't want the world to know that Boko Haram is a resolutely fundamentalist Islamic organization that it has absolutely no connection of any kind to Al-Qaeda, and that it is living out the Quran, that it's following Muhammad's example. Because once the world comes to know that, it means that every politician and every general and every media spokesperson and every leading academician in the country and in the world has deliberately and knowingly lied that they're complicit in the crime. Yes, when it is shown that Boko Haram is living as Muhammad ordered them to live, and that their heinous actions regarding terrorism and arson, kidnap, murder, are associated with Islam, which is their entire motivation for doing what they're doing, then by deceiving all who would listen, every politician, every media outlet, every general, every judge, every professor, every Islamic cleric is shown to be a liar. And when you lie on behalf of of criminals like this, you are complicit in the crime. You are no better than the rapists. The Muslim guy who tried to disassociate Islam from the kidnap and rape of these girls is every bit the kidnapper and rapist. With that recognized, let's continue this story. 
The horrific scene he and his comrades encountered a week after the kidnap on April 15th, that was 44 days ago, was in the thorny scrubland near the village of Baale, an hour's drive from Shabak, where 276 girls aged 12 to 18 were taken from their boarding school dormitories, with 223 still missing. Think about that. This place where these girls were tied to the tree was an hour's ride north of the town where they were kidnapped. They had been there a week. No one found them. The only way for no one to find them under such circumstances is for no one to be looking. And when no one is looking for something this egregious, this is infinitely worse than the airplane with a similar number of passengers disappearing from radar screens and crashing into the sky, uh, into the sea. Because on that airplane, they died almost instantly. They weren't tortured. In all likelihood, it was a catastrophic failure of the pressure vessel, and that everyone just fell asleep the moment the pressure vessel failed, and that ultimately, while asleep, the airplane plunged into the sea. They went from being conscious, trying to sleep, to unconscious, to dead without any pain, without any suffering. In this particular case, you have 223 girls that are being raped that are being tortured, that have been kidnapped, their whereabouts known. And the world doesn't seem interested in finding them or in helping them. I'm going to tell you, folks, there's only one rational conclusion that you can come to for why that's the case. They don't want the world to know the actual motivations behind these gruesome crimes. Because when the truth is known, it makes them liars. It makes them uh, equally guilty. The President of the United States is as guilty of the rape of these two little girls as were the men who perpetrated the crime because he inspired them to do it and provided the weapons while lying about their motivation, giving them the opportunity to do what they did and cover once they had done it. When these girls were found a week after the kidnapping, it was still two weeks before even social media campaigns began to promote the story among the world's conscience. You see, the mainstream media didn't. The mainstream media is every bit as guilty as our politicians. It was only via social media that the story came out. In the days following their disappearance, ragtag groups such as uh, Babas, which are called anti-machete groups, they're they're civilians trying to defend their families against the scourge of Islam. They were scouring the forest in, uh, in a convoy of Toyota pickup trucks. They were the girls' only hope. So writes the Daily Mail. Where's the United States? Where? You know, we gave billions of dollars to the Ukraine. We sent the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the head of the CIA, the head of NATO, to the Ukraine after a hundred people were killed in riots where everyone chose to participate. We gave it the highest order of priority, imposing all manner of sanctions and threats. 
And yet in this case, 223 girls are still missing. They've been kidnapped. And we haven't lifted a finger to help find them or to hold their kidnappers and rapists accountable. But hope, as the article said, has already run out for some of the hostages, according to Baba, when his group spoke to the terrified inhabitants of the village where Boko Haram had pitched camp with their captives for three days following the kidnap, they were paralyzed. I wonder really how much of the world is paralyzed. You know, it's, it's scary. It takes genuine character and enormous compassion to speak out against Islam. Because Muslims are ruthless. Muslims seek to kill anyone who exposes Muhammad for who he really was. And so, you know, it's not the average individual anymore who, is, who has the character, who has the good judgment, who has sufficient compassion to expose and condemn the religion. They know that not only are Muslims capable and have a history of a gruesome violence against those who tell the truth about their religion, sawing off their heads while screaming Allah U Akbar in great public displays. But the media is ruthless too, publicly crucifying someone who would tell you the truth. So are politicians. So is academia. All of them are vicious towards those who would propose the truth because it isn't consistent with their view of political correctness, their religion, their agenda. The chilling account that Baba received from the villagers where Boko Haram, just one hour's drive from where they had kidnapped these girls and torched their school, camped out for three days while killing two girls and raping two others, leaving them for dead, is, uh, is extraordinarily revealing. Actually, it was four dead. Two left for dead and four actually murdered there in that village. Where they camped out for three days with these girls. One hour's drive from where they were, were captured. They were terrified, the villagers. The villagers were so terrified, they wouldn't even come out of their homes and talk to the militia that was trying to find the girls. They were so terrified that they wouldn't even go out and release the two girls that were still tethered to the tree after having been raped by Boko Haram. They were so terrified. None of them were willing to help. It's really how terror works. It's why terror works. It's why religious zealots and Generals, politicians deploy terror as a tactic. I am in the midst right now of, uh, of chronicling the life of one uh, Alexander the Great because he's presented as the uh, great goat in uh, Daniel's uh, prophecy. And what you find is that uh, Alexander, for the most part, was successful because he was a vicious individual. If uh, he was opposed, he um, took a city and raised it to the ground, torching it, dividing his uh, land amongst his supporters, murdering in cold blood unarmed men and boys, all of them, while selling all of the women and children into slavery. He did it over and over and over again. He did it so often that after a while, most people simply capitulated. They were too terrified to even dream of opposing him. 
how terror works. That's what happened here. I suspect that it's um, a 50-50 scenario in the media. 50% of the motivation in the media for lying about Islam, for, for allowing the likes of a Muslim guy to deceive, is that it suits their agenda. It fits political correctness, where truth and evidence and reason are never as important as the agenda. But the other half is they're scared. You know, in talk radio, there was a period of time where after I wrote Prophet of Doom and Tea with Terrorists, I was doing five to six hours of talk radio every day. I was the single most requested um, expert guest uh, in the media. No one did more interviews. I ended up doing almost 3,000 hours of talk radio. And then the CARE began to lead boycotts against um, those hosts who were to allow me to tell their listeners the truth about Islam. And uh, some were fired. Others were harassed. Many received death threats. And one by one they folded. And we reached the point where it was we went from having hundreds of hosts, virtually every major syndicated talk radio host in the country, except uh, Sean Hannaday and uh, Rush Limbaugh, who didn't, neither had the courage to tell the truth. But virtually every other nationally syndicated host went from having me on their program with great regularity to never booking me again because of the fear of losing their job through the boycotts or fear of losing their life through the death threats. It is how Islam prevails. This town wouldn't even go and release these two girls who were tethered to the tree, who had gone a week without water because they were paralyzed with fear. It does take great courage to stand up against inhumanity. It always has. It always will. And so with political correctness rendering most Americans and many people throughout Europe incapable of exercising good judgment, depriving them of a character, of their character and of a backbone, evil becomes ever more prevalent. 